We're going to talk here about alcohol metabolism. Now, this sounds like something that's probably not really important because most of the time we're not drinking alcohol. Some of us don't drink alcohol at all. But there are a lot of clinical implications for this. And so step one likes to go after this. So you're going to want to remember um, not only the enzymes that are involved, but how they can be regulated and why they can cause different manifestations in the body. So this is very, very important stuff. All right, so we're going to start out naturally with alcohol. And in particular, we're talking about ethanol. That's the drinking alcohol. Now, alcohol is going to first be metabolized by something called alcohol. Oops, I spelled that wrong. Alcohol dehydrogenase. And so naturally, anytime we've got an enzyme called dehydrogenase, we have to use NAD and convert that to NADH. Okay, so that's our first step. And what do we make from that? We make acetaldehyde. Now, I want you to really pay attention to this generation of NADH because that's going to be really important as we come back. Next, we take acetaldehyde and we convert that to acetate. And the enzyme that does that is called acetaldehyde or aldehyde dehydrogenase. And so because it's a dehydrogenase, again, we take NAD and convert that to NADH. And like I said, that's important. We're going to come back to that in a little bit. Now, this is the pathway that happens with modest amounts of alcohol consumption. If we have a lot of alcohol consumption, then there are other pathways that uh, we have to go through in order to convert the ethanol into non-toxic metabolites. So the other way that we metabolize alcohol is through a cytochrome pathway. And in particular, that's cytochrome P2E1. Okay, and the uh, product that we use to do that is NADPH. Now, as you know, NADPH is important in detoxifying free radicals. So if we start depleting our NADPH, particularly in the liver, we're going to have increased reactive oxygen species formation. And what that's going to mean is that the liver can become damaged. And so what do we get when the liver is exposed to free radicals? Not only do we have lipid accumulation for other reasons, but we can get inflammation and ultimately fibrosis. Okay? So this is why alcohol is ultimately hepatotoxic. Now, as you're aware, if you went through our talk on the TCA cycle or on ketogenesis, where we kind of alluded to it, NADH grinds the TCA cycle to a halt. And it's not so much NADH, I mean it is, uh, but it's particularly the depletion of NAD, because we use NAD to, uh, to, to convert a lot of those products into other products in the TCA cycle, okay? Um, now, I've got a sort of a map of this that I'm going to come to to help this make a little more sense. Uh, but suffice it to say that when we accumulate NADH, it slows the TCA cycle, and when we slow the TCA cycle, it increases our acetyl-CoA because acetyl-CoA goes into the TCA cycle. And so what that means is that acetyl-CoA is going to 
go into all the other things that acetyl-CoA can go into making. It goes into making fatty acids, and so that's why we get our lipid accumulation, and so you can get steatosis of the liver, and it goes into making ketones, and so we get increased ketone synthesis. And so that causes something called alcoholic ketoacidosis. So with very high alcohol consumption, you can get ketones in the blood. Okay, now what else gets broken down by these enzymes? It's not just ethanol. It can also be methanol, which is a wood alcohol and a poison, and ethylene glycol, which is found in antifreeze. Now, these are poisonous, but it's important. Oops, ethylene glycol. It's important because you may get questions on the test about poisoning, and you'll need to know that the way that it's metabolized is through this process, and methanol and ethylene glycol by itself is not toxic. It's the metabolites that are toxic. And so when we use treatment uh, for methanol poisoning or ethylene glycol poisoning, we need to interfere with this process. So first of all, methanol, when it's broken down by alcohol dehydrogenase, becomes formaldehyde. And formaldehyde, when it's broken down by aldehyde dehydrogenase, becomes formate or formic acid. And formic acid is toxic to the eyes and it can cause blindness. And so that's the end result of methanol poisoning. Ethylene glycol gets first converted to glycoaldehyde. I'm just going to write glycoald here. And then that gets converted by uh, aldehyde dehydrogenase to oxalate. And you're probably aware that oxalate forms stones in the kidneys. So that causes renal failure. And there are also products from glycoaldehyde and ethylene glycol uh, that get into the blood and cause cerebral edema. Okay, so oxalate itself and formic acid are acidic, and so when they're in the blood, it causes a non-anion gap metabolic acidosis. And so remember your mud piles, mnemonic, um, methanol and ethylene glycol uh, can cause non-anion non gap metabolic acidosis. So what do we do when you've got a patient that has ethylene has acute ingestion of ethylene glycol or methanol? Let's say it's a child that got into antifreeze or it's a, an alcoholic that decided um, maybe I should drink something else with something kind of like alcohol, so I'll drink methanol or something like that, okay? What you're going to do is you're going to give them something called fomepazole. And fomepazole is, it, it uses alcohol dehydrogenase. So it's essentially a competitive inhibitor for alcohol dehydrogenase. And so the result is that ethylene glycol and methanol are not going to get converted to their toxic metabolites. And so it gives us time then to dialyze these patients and get that ethylene glycol and methanol out of their body. Uh, another thing that you could do, which, which used to be done in the olden days, is give them ethanol. Give them alcohol because that's also going to competitively inhibit alcohol dehydrogenase. I and mean, you're not really inhibiting it. You're just using it up. Uh, so it, it, it competes with the ethylene glycol and the methanol. Um, so you could use that too, but fomepazole is what we give for ethylene glycol and methanol poisoning. It buys us some time. Now, ethylene glycol and methanol cannot be excreted, so you're going to have to do something to get that, uh, that, that poison out of them, and so often we go to uh, dialyzing.
Um, but this is important for you to know that Fomepazole is given for these two poisonings. Now, another thing that comes up on the exam is something called disulfiram. Now, disulfiram is also known as antabuse and disulfiram. And it used to be given, not so much anymore, it used to be given uh, for alcoholics to discourage them from drinking. And the reason for that is because acetaldehyde is not particularly toxic, but it's what is responsible for some of the symptoms of hangover. So if you are on disulfiram and you start drinking, you're going to have a really bad time. Uh, so it's kind of a, a disincentive for drinking. Now, another way that this comes up, and it's probably more likely, is that there are certain drugs that behave like, like disulfiram. And we call that drugs with a disulfiram-like reaction. And you are going to be responsible for knowing the major drugs that have a disulfiram-like reaction. And so those are sulfonylureas, which are given for diabetes type 2 diabetes, also cephalosporins, some of the cephalosporins at least, which are obviously antibiotics, metronidazole, another antibiotic, and griseofulvin, the antifungal. So those drugs have a disulfiram-like reaction, and so those patients that are on those drugs need to avoid alcohol. Okay, so what happens when a person has, is drinking and they drink a lot in particular? So what's going to happen, first of all, is that we grind the TCA cycle to a halt. So what's going to happen is acetyl-CoA is going to build up. And so because acetyl-CoA cannot go into the TCA cycle, it's going to go into making keto acids, it's going to go into making lactate, and it's going to go into making fatty acids. So what that means is that you're going to get a steatosis of the liver, and you're going to go into having a non-anion gap metabolic acidosis because you build up keto acids and lactate. Now, another thing that's going to happen is that you've got all this NADH. And so one of the things, as we mentioned, is that you grind the TCA cycle to a halt. But another thing is that we're going to have a hard time converting malate to oxaloacetate. And remember that converting malate to oxaloacetate is one of the really important steps in gluconeogenesis. Malate goes to oxaloacetate and oxaloacetate goes to phosphoenopyruvate by the enzyme PEPCK, phosphoenopyruvate carboxykinase. And so this here is going to slow down. And so what that means is that you are going to have a hard time with gluconeogenesis, and so you'll have a fasting hypoglycemia with heavy alcohol use. Now, another thing that's going to happen is because we have high levels of DHAP from glycolysis, which we can still do, and because we have high levels of NADH from the metabolism of alcohol, this process here, dihydroxyacetone phosphate to glycerol 3-phosphate, is going to ramp up. And glycerol 3-phosphate ultimately will make triglycerides, and triglycerides will make fatty acid, and so that's going to encourage the development of steatosis. So all of this happens because we have high levels of NADH relative to NAD. And so what's happening is that the TCA cycle is ground to a halt, which diverts acetyl-CoA into making keto acids, lactate, and fatty acids. Oxaloacetate goes down because we cannot convert malate to oxaloacetate. And so gluconeogenesis is going to slow down, causing a hypoglycemia. 
And dihydroxyacetone phosphate, which is a product of glycolysis, is going to get shunted over into glycerol 3-phosphate. Not only because we have a high level of acetyl-CoA, which ultimately is a product of glycolysis of DHAP, but because we have very high levels of NADH, which DHAP uses to get converted to glycerol 3-phosphate. And glycerol 3-phosphate ultimately then is going to make fatty acids. And so that contributes to hepatic steatosis.